Good morning, I'm Samira Ahmed, also on today's programme. Weddings may still be big business, but they're in decline, with cohabiting couples on the increase. So is marriage a thing of the past? If I had my way, I probably wouldn't get married and would just live together and be happy. Uh, but my fiance here, she felt marriage was something that she really wanted and it was important to her. And we enter the world of the Ottomans and the empire that lasted for 600 years as Raghi Omar tells us about his new landmark BBC series. Well, joining me this week for a special debate are Peter Hitchens, author and former foreign correspondent. He's a columnist on the Mail on Sunday. Yvonne Ridley is a journalist who was captured by the Taliban in September 2001. She converted to Islam after release and has become a vocal supporter of Muslim causes. Peter Neumann is Professor of Security Studies at King's College London and is Director of the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation. And Usama Hassan fought with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against Soviet forces before changing his views on jihad. He's now part of the counter-terrorism think tank, the Quilliam Foundation. We want to know what you think. If you have a webcam, you can join us via Skype. You can also give your views on Twitter or by phone. Phone calls cost up to five pence a minute from most landlines and calls from mobiles may cost considerably more. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Now, British Muslims have taken part in foreign conflicts around the world, including Afghanistan, Bosnia and Syria. Now it's claimed that some young Muslims have also been recruited from the UK by Al-Shabaab, which espouses jihad or holy war and claims responsibility for the attack on the Westgate Mall in Kenya, in which at least 67 men, women and children died. One British woman Muslim convert with alleged links to terrorism has been put on Interpol's wanted list. But why are some young Muslims attracted by the idea of jihad? The attack in Kenya by al-Shabaab, taking place as it did in a shopping mall, brought home once again the true horror of terrorism. British Muslim convert Samantha Luthwaite, dubbed the White Widow, who was married to one of the London 77 suicide bombers, has been linked with the planning of the attack but so far there is no concrete evidence to support this. However, she is sought for questioning over another alleged terrorist-related offence, and Interpol has circulated her details, describing her as dangerous. It's been reported that there could be around 50 Britons involved with al-Shabaab, and Americans too. Like other terrorist movements, the organization uses the internet to glamorize its activities. If you guys only knew how much fun we have over here, this is the real Disneyland. You need to come here and join us. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite all the Muslims who are living in the lands of disbelief to the lands of jihad. It was the dead of night when he finally departed. There has been action to limit the spread of radical teaching by Muslim clerics in the UK. Abu Qatada has been deported to Jordan. And Omar Bakri Mohammed is banned from Britain. But the killing of drummer Lee Rigby on a London street, the foiling of other terrorist plots, and the continuing resonance of the 7-7 bombings has left a shadow over the Muslim community. And even though prominent leaders and imams in Britain continually speak out against extremism, some critics say that Muslims need to do more to tackle attempts to radicalise young people. So are Muslims doing enough to prevent radicalisation? Yvonne Ridley. It's very difficult. You know, the Muslim community is being bashed in one direction for not doing enough. It uh, feels under fire. You go into mosques where political discussion is banned. Uh, young people are not encouraged to talk about Iraq, Afghanistan, political issues. And this is uh, wrong. You know, we need more discussion in the mosques, in the Muslim community. Uh, before I converted to Islam, I, I was a 
practicing Christian. The church I went to in St. James's in Piccadilly had a political sermon every Sunday and the mic was passed around okay. and we discussed things openly. Plenty to discuss there. And it's the question for our text vote today. Are Muslims doing enough to prevent radicalization of young people? Text the word votes followed by yes or no to 81771. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You can only vote once. Go online to vote for free and results will be announced at the end of the show and visit bbc.co.uk slash Sunday Morning Live, where you can also read full terms and conditions. Um, Peter Hitchens, there is a sense that there's a lot of... A lot of the news media focus only on the negative and that a lot of coverage of Muslims in Britain is negative. And could that, in some way, be part of the bigger picture in which young people feel alienated and potentially radicalised? No, I, m Muslims are, are covered in this, in, in this way because news tends to be negative. News is when things go wrong. And that inevitably means that when you get covered by newspapers, it'll be when you do things which are wrong. But when people do things or say things which are, are, are generally considered by an awful lot of people to be outrageous, it's not surprising uh, that the media cover it. And I think it's perfectly right for the media to cover it. Islam, if you're, if you're a believer, is, is the core belief of your lifetime. If you're not a believer, it's a philosophical and political position with which you can disagree. And a lot of people do disagree with it, and they're quite right to criticise it if they do so. Okay. Uh, Osama, you did take up arms in the name of jihad. You fought the Soviets in, in Afghanistan when you were younger. Can you tell us briefly what made you do that? I was fighting uh, for God and uh, for the Muslim nation. I felt very strongly that uh, any cause involving Muslims abroad was my cause. And there was also a, a desire for martyrdom, etc. Um, it was also very exhilarating. It was really cool as a young man. I was only 19. To, to learn to fire guns and to fire them actually in anger on the front lines in these spectacular mountains uh, was really exhilarating and really inspiring and something which uh, stayed with me for the rest of my life. What made you change your mind? And you know, what distinctions do you make? did you start to make about different kinds of jihad and where, you, where it was appropriate? Well, our group sent dozens of fighters to Afghanistan and, and to the Bosnian War in the 90s and we saw that as a legitimate jihad where Muslims faced ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, for example. But uh, one wing of the Mujahideen movement became Al-Qaeda and started justifying attacks on Western civilians and increasingly killing Muslims around the world as well. So after 9-11, I did a lot of soul searching and realized there was a big difference between ethical, legitimate jihad, always has been for centuries in Islamic jurisprudence, and with the subversion of that, where it was being used for terrorism and indiscriminate attacks on civilians in, in non theaters of war. And just, just briefly, the idea that you said, I found the idea of martyrdom attractive. I mean, many people will be astounded at that and they don't understand this appeal. Can you explain it? No, I think for anybody who has an ethical position in life, it, it's perfectly logical, which is to uh, live and die um, striving and struggling for noble causes. You know, better to stick to principles of truth and justice, stand up for what's right. Just, and just tell us briefly, where did you get recruited into this group that sent people off to jihad? Was this at college or where? This was at, at Boston University and College, and in fact, it's a core teaching of, uh, of Islam to live a noble life and, and to offer your life for, uh, to God. Martyrdom is a Greek word, which is also in the, okay. in the Christian scriptures. Well, we'll go, we'll go into the details of kind of martyrdom and, and jihad in a bit, but, but Peter Neumann, I mean, it's interesting that it was at university, and in universities, prisons, these places are still the, the areas where people worry about radicalization and why young people are still being targeted and are vulnerable to it. Yes, and I call them places of vulnerability because often people go to university and they feel quite lost. They're quite susceptible to people approaching them, building networks around them, and giving them a sense that they have a place to belong. That's why universities, I think, are vulnerable places for, for radicalization, but also prison. What's interesting is that over the past few years, we've seen some of that shifting. So there aren't radical mosques anymore in the, in the same way that they used to be before 2001. A lot of this happens online now, in addition to the actual places. Peter um, Hitchens, it's interesting, and Yvonne was saying it as well, that actually there's been a shutting down of a lot of debate around politics in places like mosques. And I wonder if, in a way, that's counterproductive. What? If it makes people feel that they go off and discuss it in these private groups, and maybe that's how they get sucked into radicalisation. Well, this raises this whole issue of, of radicalisation and getting excited about it. I mean, a lot of young people will always be revolutionaries. I was myself from the ages of 17 to 24, a revolutionary socialist who believed in the overthrow of the capitalist system by violence. And look at me now. Uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that you will do anything terrible. And if we judge people in our law-governed society, not by what they think, 
or by what they say, unless it's actual incitement to violence, we judge them by what they do. I think there's an awful lot of rubbish talked, actually, about radicalization and trying to prevent it and trying to reach into people's minds in, in, in this fashion. If people want to discuss these things, the more openly they do it, the better. And also, actually, from a straightforward security point of view, the more openly they do it, the better, because then you'll know who they are. And when they do start doing things, if they do start doing things, you'll be able to do something about it. You see, you can't change the way people think, but I think back to the, the real national concern there was about cults in the 70s and 1980s, um, and this idea that you needed to deprogram in some cases because people were so young. There's been the targeting of people with learning difficulties yes, by and, Islamists sometimes. And, and you sympathise with the families which are affected by this. Of course you do, because the, it, it's a horrible thing for them. But the idea that you can in some way reach into somebody's mind using the authority of the state and try and change the way they think ought to, to be repellent. I think, to any free person. It's just not something you should think of doing. People change their minds, not because they're made to, but because actually of experience of life uh, and, and, and of coming up against things and finding out that what they believed was wrong. And they will change their minds in that case. They can sometimes be made to change their minds by debate. But as I say, the thing we are concerned with in a free society is not what people think, but what they do. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, Peter, I, I, do you want to take I that think, one first? It's an interesting challenge, isn't it? I think it? it's, it's, it's very important. If you do what uh, Osama did or other people did, if you want to blow yourself up, you have to be 100% certain that that is the right thing to do. And uh, that's why I think that you need to really provide counter voices because not in order to convince people that your point of view is wrong, but maybe to insert that 10% element of doubt that will prevent you from blowing yourself up because you need to be 100% sure. And that's why it's important to have these safe spaces for discussion, not to have people convince each other of each other's point of view, but because it inserts that element of doubt that prevents you from doing something. But could I, could I, could I, there's a very important Briefly. point here, which I'd just like to try and get off my chest first, first and foremost, which is this. If we are arguing with the Muslim criticism of Western society, then we should stop arguing with it by nature of, 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 of force, saying in, in, re in response to what militant Muslims do, in response to what violent Muslims do, we will respond with violence and wars against terror. And, to, and to, I always remember when George W. Bush was denouncing at some point some terrorist action, he said, they, the Muslims, they hate our way of life. And I said, well, actually, in many ways, I hate our way of life as well. There's an awful lot about modern Western society, uh, which is squalid and, and, and and degenerate, it's seen from a straightforward right. Christian point of view. There is a critique there. There's a, there's a much better answer to it than armed force and secret police techniques and surveillance, which is to argue about what the solution to it is. Uh, the trouble is that our society, having abandoned the Christian faith largely, doesn't have much of an answer to it beyond saying, we're better, okay. you're worse. Yvonne. Well, I find myself in the unusual position of agreeing with a lot of what uh, Peter is saying. But, um, you know, y you're describing yourself as a 17-year-old, as a revolutionary. Um, I'm just wondering if you would have come under the attention of the security services, if think tanks would have been out there um, creating fear about individuals like yourself. And, you know, when you see the way that uh, discussions are being closed down in universities, uh, which are places of learning where young people should be able to push out the envelope and explore, um, and yet uh, they're being closed down. Well, there is After a specific one. We definitely, definitely did come under. We definitely did come under. We definitely did come under under the eye of the security services mm -hmm. without any doubt at all. Okay, um, Simon. I was just going to say, discussion has been closed down in both directions. So I agree, mosques should be places where people can discuss politics and, and the things that matter to them. But in some cases, in mosques and university campuses. Extremists have shut down the discourse. Anybody who uh, criticises the prevailing but extremist what's your, discourse... You're an extremist. Point. It, 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 I'm finish this point. Well, well, and anybody who's openly supporting Al-Qaeda, for example, and glorifying uh, terrorism, which has happened in a, in a very small number of mosques and university campuses, it has to be said. But there are people there who've shut down that debate, and anybody who's criticised that who've been forced out of the mosque or Islamic societies. And universities, for example, have to do more. It's not just Muslims that have to deal with this problem. This is a, okay. an issue for the whole of British society. You see, the Korean Very Foundation on, called me an else. extremist. I don't support Al-Qaeda. I mean, why would you call me an extremist? Why would you write to a TV station saying, don't use this woman, she's an extremist? 
Well, I, I, I didn't take part in that. that was before my time, but I've been I've been called an extremist by okay. I've been well, called we'll, an extremist we'll by friends of yours, the whole example, issue of, of how, how, how Muslims are, are labelled generally. But I'd like to bring in another contributor, who's Yasmin Alibi Brown. She joins us from our London studio. Um, Yasmin's a journalist who's been writing for many years about her concerns over uh, radicalisation. You've heard the debate so far. There's this particular interest in whether debate is being shut down in places like mosques and universities, and whether it should actually be opened up again. What's your view about why there's still such a problem with radicalisation among the young? Well, I think um, I agree with uh, Osama that it has to be a proper debate. Whenever I write anything that this kind of growing conservative, with a small c, uh, brand of Islam that has grown across the West and everywhere else, if you raise anything that they don't like, they shut you down. Yeah, they shut you down. In what sense do they shut you down? They, they threaten you. They, um, I mean, I've had... I have very severe problems, for example, with the veil. And I wrote some very reasoned columns about it. Well, you should see the correspondence. They're not open to debate. And I, I've been thinking about this. I think it's wrong to say, what should Muslims do about this? I think the question should be, should, what should we all do about it? And I understand their anger. And I do agree with Peter completely on his analysis about um, these wars and so on. But there's a problem now, which we never had before, which is a slow kind of growth of the idea that you can never belong to the societies in which you live. Isn't that a Muslim problem? If there is, as you say, a growing um, conservative strain, which is becoming mainstream. I mean, I was thinking of sectarianism. There's a lot more attacks on, for example, Ahmadiyya Muslims. And this is all going on in modern Britain. Yes, but it's, it's this idea that there's only one way to be a Muslim. We can't talk about it. And also that you can't belong. Now, we get enough <laughs> kind of flack anyway from, uh, from other people saying you can't belong. But when we start saying we don't want to belong, and there is this kingdom somewhere that we're now going to belong to and fight for, that's quite twisted. Yasmin, stay with us. I want to put that issue to... Um, uh, Sheikh Dr. Mohammed Al Husseini, um, who's an imam and a fellow in Islamic studies uh, for the Westminster Institute. You know, the concept of jihad, we know, is, is really contested and difficult. But also what Yasmin raised, this idea of the ummah, the brotherhood, which can be a very positive one. There's a danger, isn't there, that it's also being a way of saying to Muslims, you're never going to be part of a country, you should never have a national allegiance. Somehow the brotherhood of Muslims out there is more important. Is that a theological problem? Well, um, the notion of being a Muslim is a standing in relation to God, and that's how our holy scriptures, as indeed the scriptures of other Abrahamic religions, have articulated it. Uh, I never bought a green membership card to be a member of this so-called Muslim community. I have, like every other British citizen, multiple belongings, multiple identities. You know me as a fiddle player and, a, and an academic and a member of a family and a member of a, a nation and a culture. Um, I think what I'm concerned about is uh, a growing political correctness that erodes uh, the academic freedom uh, within which we can talk about questions about, uh, such as jihad. Uh, there's not a single one of my Jewish rabbinical colleagues, for example, who isn't thoroughly embarrassed, or indeed uh, Christian theological colleagues who are thoroughly embarrassed about certain passages in the Bible that promote uh, violence or slavery or uh, child marriage or stoning. Uh, and in a culture such as ours, which is one of intellectual freedom, we need to have the ability to discuss these questions in relation to, to Islam and to Muslims into what the Quran has to well, say. How we no have longer they done live it? In, a, in a desert society of brutal uh, desert uh, vendettas and blood feuds. And, and our texts need to be uh, revisited and revised in, in connection to uh, the current realities in which we live, a plural society with multiple belongings. What I'm worried about is that there, we have an interfaith industry which is taxpayer funded. We talk about challenging extremism, but we give millions of pounds in taxpayers' money to organizations like the Interfaith Network for the United Kingdom, whose membership includes Islamist groups like the, uh, uh, the Islamic Foundation, the Muslim Council of Britain, far-right Hindu nationalist groups like the VHP, and there's a report coming out next month that outlines these things. I think we need to look at the contradiction 
contradictions in our strategy in relation to all these matters and promote intellectual freedom and free debate about core theological questions. Thank you, Dr. Al-Husseini. Um, Yasmin, what, what's your reaction to what Dr. Al-Husseini was saying there? Oh, God, I wish I could go and speak to him. He speaks for so many of us. You know, one of the awful things is that what he's had the courage to say, even I sometimes find I don't have the courage to say, let's look at all of these things afresh. But, you know, there is a shutdown. So when Muslims complain that debates are being shut down, they're right to complain. But we mus they, Muslims, are also shutting down the kind of debates we need to have. Thank you. Um, Osama, uh, you know, the Quilliam Foundation that you now work for, it very much works on you know, counter-terrorism and on helping people who've had a background in radicalism. And I just wonder, in, in your experience, is there something about converts that makes them more vulnerable to um, extremist ideologies? We've talked a lot about problems innate within Muslim debate, but, but conversion is a part of the issue, isn't it? Well, not necessarily, but uh, clearly some converts have got involved with terrorism very quickly. For example, the shoe bomber, going back some years, one of the 7-7 bombers, and his widow, who's now wanted for similar offences, the Woolwich suspects, uh, bombings in Exeter and Bristol, or attempted bombings at least. Uh, one of the problems, again, the Muslim community has to deal with is making the mosques and Islamic organisation more welcome for converts. I've been working with the community for over 30 years, and many, many converts uh, complain that mosques are unlike Pakistani or Bangladeshi or Arab clubs, if you like. And uh, there's a strong cultural element there where uh, Westerners, uh, Western converts to Islam, don't really feel welcome. And if they're going to be then ostracized or marginalized, they may be more vulnerable to the okay. extremist groups, especially if they don't know too much about Islam. Being new in the faith, they can be uh, radicalized that way. Peter Hitchens, what's your thoughts about the discussion that we've just heard with, with Yasmin and uh, Dr. Hadis? Well, I think one could often encounter uh, intelligent, liberal-minded Muslims living in the West who take this sort of attitude towards the faith. But the trouble is, how much do they speak for the religion as a whole? When I went, I traveled to Deoband, where one of the great Muslim universities is in, in India, and I talked to some of the, the teachers there, and I said, this thought that the Quran could be changed, that you could go through a reformation like the Christian one, uh, is that possible? And they said, absolutely not. It is the unmediated word of God. It isn't possible to change it. They can't, by, by their nature, accept this. And I think one, one has to turn to Muslims and say, this is what you believe, and you, you're, you are, in a way, stuck with it. If you want to have a debate about, the, the, about what religious precepts people should, should follow, then I would say the great debate that has to be had in this country, and ought to be had before it's too late, is whether we should accept... Uh, Islam as being the predominant religion among us, which I think is quite possible in the next century of the way things are going, or whether we should rediscover our own Christian roots, argue for them, and say to our Muslim friends, brothers and sisters, that this is a Christian country and that's th th that, that is what that is the rule which we have decided on the well, well, basis of our civilization. To... You'll have to accept that too. I just want to put that to uh, Dr. Al Husseini. Um, if you heard what Peter Hitchens was saying, it's a sense that there's a fundamental you know, non-negotiation about um, the status of Islamic belief, and that's the biggest problem we've got. Well, I don't think that's at all true. Um, we have uh, a practice of uh, engagement by uh, scholars from the Jewish, Christian, Islamic uh, traditions, looking deep into our texts, looking deep into the vastness and the uh, contradictory nature of our, our, our traditions. We're not actually that different. Our texts contain materials that are, uh, that are profoundly uplifting. The Abrahamic traditions have promoted the, uh, the worship of the one God, provided ethical codes for us, but they've also provided bases for uh, behaviors that are deeply disturbing and have been deeply disturbing to people over the centuries. They've promoted violence uh, and, and genocide, and, and these things can be looked at uh, together in a shared scriptural uh, conversation, and that's exactly the kind of work that we're doing. All right. What but, I'm concerned very about briefly, is Dr. that in the art of the interfaith industry of saying nice things we don't really mean to people we don't but really like, what we've ended up doing is promoting certain Muslim groups like the MCB, which in reality don't represent the British Muslim public. Uh, the Policy Exchange did a, a survey that showed only 6%, only 6% 
of British Muslims surveyed felt that the MCB represented okay. them in any way, shape or form. Well, thank you, thank you. Can I say, I a just, silent majority of the Muslim community. All right, thank you. I just want to bring in Peter Neumann, who's yeah, yeah. self-appointed Thank you, Dr. Hossein. There's so many interesting I think, issues. I, I think it's important also to point out that it's not just about the content of the Islamic faith. The, what draws people into radical extremist or terrorist groups is as much the sense of brotherhood that people get, the idea of embracing a cause, the, the idea of belonging to something. And you can almost mold any kind of ideology into that direction. So I would, uh, I would advise, it's important to have that discussion about the content of the Islamic faith, how it is twisted, how it can be misinterpreted. But it's also important to pay attention to other factors because a 17-year-old is not an expert in yeah. Islamic ideology. And I should just say that um, the Muslim Council of Britain, who Dr. al Hussaini referred to, though we don't have someone from them on to um, you know, defend what they think is their ideology. I just want to move on slightly, Peter, and, and I'll let you in, um, back in on this. But there is an issue about if there is a politically correct attempt to shut down open discussion. Is there also an issue whether Muslims portray themselves as victims? Um, you know, whether in Syria, where they want Western intervention, or in Iraq, where you know, the West shouldn't have intervened? Well, people always betray themselves as victims if they want to get help. But I just do want to respond to something Dr. Al Husseini said. It, this is, I'm not saying that he's insincere in what he says about wanting to, to alter the, the, the precepts of, of Islam in some way. But we do face this problem, and it is really most strongly shown in the treatment of women by Islam, in their, 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 their legal position okay. as, su as subject to men, and the way, the, way, the, way, the way in which they, they are they're increasingly pressured, as, as Yasmin correctly said, pressured to, to take the veil. This is a very, very fundamental disagreement, and it's not going away, okay. and it's getting stronger. But and also there is the, the other final no, Peter, thing, you cannot the leave the Islamic Peter. faith. It's an absolute offence against the Islamic faith to leave it. And it, it well, that, many let's entrances raise that, and no exits, let's and that is a very that. fundamental thing which does not change. The issue that Yasmin was making to some extent is that, you know, there is a growing conservatism in the public voice of Islam. And, for example, Muslims who leave the faith say that they have to keep it quiet or they get terrible treatment in some cases. That is a concern, isn't it? The Quran makes it perfectly clear that there is no compulsion Sure, but in, in reality in Britain, do you accept there's a problem that Muslims feel there's a growing conservatism and you can't leave the faith without it potentially being really quite dangerous? Well, they're being told that there is. The, the, um, you don't the, think there's a problem, though? No, Osama, I don't, I don't think, think that it? there is. We should go to Dioban then and ask them. They'll tell you apostasy is an absolute uh, unchangeable Well, they're ultra-conservative, Dioban, and, and they, yeah, they, don't, certainly are. they don't represent the majority but of the But we can all pick by, by out religious texts. And, and, and there is a reformation in, in progress. I'm, I'm sorry, Peter, you may not be aware of this, but uh, the arguably a reformation has been going on for a century and a half. Now, the medieval law on apostasy, which was very strict, and as Yvonne says, goes against the Quran, which says no compulsion in religion. That was repealed by the Ottomans in the mid-19th okay. well, century. Okay, well, we'll be hearing about the Ottomans later, but we're Egypt. talking about Britain in the 21st century. Yvonne, those discussions what are more happening. did you want well, to say? Uh, I, I would just like to pick up on several things that um, Dr. Mohammed al Husseini said. And, you know, he was talking about interfaith and talking about excluding groups. He mentioned... Um, uh, a couple of Muslim groups, he mentioned a Hindu group. When you start excluding groups, especially in interfaith, an all-encompassing concept, you know, that's when you're heading down, um, you know, I suppose what's lines. interesting is that we have all this interfaith dialogue at a time where we've got growing concerns about homegrown, you know, British Muslim terrorists getting involved in, in incidents uh, abroad. I, I think there are two separate issues. The, the fact that uh, religions have become more conservative over the past 30 years is not only true for Islam, it's also true for Jewish orthodoxy, it's also true for Christian evangelicals. It's been a worldwide trend and there are reasons for that. That is a problem for societies. There's a separate problem, which is about terrorism. And the two things don't always necessarily, okay. are not always necessarily connected. All right. Um, I'd like to bring in, um, well, I'd just like to move the discussion a bit onto solutions then, if we are looking for um, a way out. Um, and we're joined by uh, Mustafa um, Akyol, um, who's from, i trying to think, Islam. He's the author of Islam Without Extremes. Um, you've been studying, you know, how radicalization is making people, in some cases, take up a, a jihad. Do you think there's a difference between people going to places like Syria, um, you know, joining groups like Al-Shabaab? Is there a difference between, between them? There is a difference. First, let me tell you, if you will, uh, I don't live in the UK, I live in Turkey, and there is sometimes a difference between a Muslim minority in a larger non-Muslim society and the communal tensions created by that might lead to more radicalization. 
because I sometimes hear some radical voices in the UK which are unparalleled in Turkey. And I think that comes from those communal tensions that are then the, the doctrine of Islam itself. Uh, and one more thing, I agree that apostasy, the banner on apostasy, is a problem in mainstream Islamic tradition, but it's not Quranic, and it should be interpreted, as I argue in my book, uh, in a chapter on freedom from Islam. As for jihad, the word, the concept jihad should not be demonized, as some, as some Islamophobes in the West have been doing. We should actually uh, criticize and condemn groups like Al-Shabaab uh, Al uh, Al or Al-Qaeda, for violating the rules of jihad. Uh, classical Islamic doctrine, I even in Middle Ages, they have, the, the doctrine have made a big difference between combatants and non-combatants. Okay. And nowhere in Islamic history, non-combatants were considered as legitimate targets. What Al-Qaeda and its ilk does in the past few decades is that they, with some twisted interpretation, justify the killing of everybody, basically, who disagrees with them. Okay. So they are actually violating the rules of jihad as defined by Quran All right, and Mustafa, Islamic tradition. Thank you. Can I bring Yasmin Alibi Brown back in here? Um, Yasmin, I can't help feeling I've heard this argument about, um, well, it's, you know, Al-Qaeda Al aren't actually, you know, good Muslims. But it's not... It's not necessarily helping, is it, in terms of young people getting radicalised? What do you think the solution is? Well, I think it's, it's, it's um, a very clever trick. Whenever Muslims do anything wrong, and let's face it, many Muslims do a lot of very bad things. They're not the only ones, but they do. And when I talk about them, people say, but they're not real Muslims. So, I'm sorry, once you've started saying they're not real Muslims, you've disengaged with the problem. It's a difficult problem. I come from a community which is ostracized everywhere by, by Sunni Muslims in particular, right? Um, because we're not considered part of the real Islam. And that started with the death of the Prophet, these schisms. But nowadays, there is this terrible problem because what happens is these purists just deny all responsibility for the bad things that are done right. by Muslims. Yes, Min, thank you. I want the panel briefly to respond on solutions then to radicalization. Osama first, working with the Quilliam Foundation, what works? Muslims need to recapture the spirit of Islam in the end, which is about uh, faith in God and, but even more practically, and love and mercy. What yeah. do you do at Quilliam that's helping young people like yourself turn the back on Well, jihad? we're challenging the, the narratives, which were very narrow and superficial, which pitted the whole world into a war between Muslims and everybody else, and misusing scripture to do that. One of the things we do is to point out the diversity of thought within Muslim tradition right from the beginning right. and to so encourage kind of people to theology. have that debate. Okay. Um, By closing down Yvonne. debate in universities. Well, Yvonne, how would, what's your solution, true. briefly? It is. Uh, you need to open up uh, the universities to, um, to a real full debate and bring in so-called extremists. University students aren't idiots. If somebody is standing up spouting nonsense they're not going to be sucked in and i think we have to give our young people more credit by having an open debate and exploring all the avenues a number of islamic society presidents have become terrorists one tried to blow up a plane in 2009 a number you're and, talking and a number. one example and this is the trouble you know you go on about converts to islam there are more than a hundred thousand converts to islam in britain since 9 11. the majority of female in their 30s we aren't going out um, to blow ourselves up, and yet that is the way uh, the perception that the Quilliam Foundation okay, just will give. These aren't normal students. Peter Hitchens, the president of the Islamic well. Society. I just very briefly want to go back to uh, Mustafa to say, how do you tell um, Al Qaeda that they don't represent Muslims? There's no leader. You know, there's there's no there's no caliph, is there? So how do you how do you do this thing with theology that's supposed to change everything? First of all, I should say that. My argument is that they're not real Muslims and we are the real Muslims. They are Muslims, I mean, Al-Qaeda and the fanatics. But they are fanatic Muslims, and that's, that's the problem. And they don't represent the majority of the Muslims. And their particular interpretation of Islam has been detached even from tradition. Uh, when it comes to, for example, concepts like jihad. Uh, in particular, they also believe in a certain conspiratorial vision of the world in which every conflict in the Muslim world, so you they can't, believe, you can't is a conspiracy by the West. All right. so I'm afraid we have to leave it there, Mustafa, because we, we don't have much time. But thank you. Sorry, it was just a brief 
brief chance. Peter Hitchens. Well, they say the same about him. That's the trouble. And there is no authority to which anybody can appeal in Islam. They, 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 they can't, neither of them can agree on which is right. Uh, one small point the, the man, Solutions the man, who, blew, man who blew up the plane would not have been prevented from blowing up the plane by the shutting down of debate. Uh, as far as I can see, that's neither here nor there. Open and free debate is always the best way to deal with any idea in society. Can we stop referring to Islamophobia? Uh, there is no such thing. People are perfectly entitled to dislike and criticize Islam if they, if they wish to. It is a political position which you can legitimately okay. disagree with. It's not a pathology. Finally, if, this, if our society is to defend ourselves against this, then I would think that rediscovery of the beauty and force of the Christian religion might be a very good start. Okay, and Peter Neumann, final word to you. it's very important Solutions. what Osama said about challenging the narrative, but it should happen not only in universities or in prisons, but also especially online, because I think online a lot of the extremist voices are totally uncounted. A lot of the traditional groups are not online. They are not doing the work where young people are, and that's where it has to happen. Thank you. Thank you all so much indeed for that very considered discussion. To all our contributors on webcam as well. Our vote on this is open. I know people have been contributing a lot on it online. The question, are Muslims doing enough to prevent radicalisation of young people? Remember, you can only vote once if you think they are. Text the word vote followed by yes, and if you think they aren't, text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771, and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You have around 20 minutes before the vote closes. Now, there are 18 million families in the UK, but only 12 million married couples. Weddings have almost halved since the 1980s, whilst the number of cohabiting couples has doubled in the past 15 years. The government's just signalled its support for tying the knot by announcing tax breaks for married couples, with the Prime Minister describing marriage as the commitment which helps bind families. But does the decline of marriage mean it's a thing of the past? Fewer people may be getting married than ever before, but it still remains a multi-billion pound industry in the UK. At a wedding show in Belfast this weekend, there were plenty of things to splash out on. Many couples were planning for their big day, and not surprisingly, few here felt marriage was a vanishing institution. I wouldn't consider marriage a thing of the past because you know, when you find your true love, you, you want to spend your life with them. So I totally believe in it. And it's, it's great organising and arranging and having a day out with your friends and family. It's amazing. I'm a Christian myself. Um, so marriage for us is the next step, which will then allow us to live together. If I had my way, I probably wouldn't get married and would just live together and be happy. Uh, but my fiance here, she felt marriage was something that she really wanted and it was important to her. I love her, I want to be with her. I don't want to be with anybody else, I don't have a problem with that. So yeah, that's why we're getting married. Yeah. <laughs> Cohabitation is now the fastest growing family type in Britain. However, it may not be the happiest, according to a recent study by the Marriage Foundation, which claims that cohabiting couples with children are more likely to split up than those who are married. We work in the wedding industry and we've been in it for quite a few years now and I do think that more and more people are getting, are living together first, having families and then deciding that yes, we'll tie the knot and get married. The tax breaks planned by the government were welcomed but most people didn't see them as an incentive to say I do. In terms of tax breaks and things like that, when was the last time you got involved in something that you thought, do you know what would be brilliant? Let's get the government involved in this too. I don't think so. I don't think the government needs to be a part of marriage. I think it should really be down to the couples. I don't believe you should have any incentive to get married. If you wish to get married because you love each other, that should be sufficient reason to get married, really. I'm not, and I wouldn't want any, I never wanted any incentive to marry Phyllis. <laughs> the fact that I loved her was a reason that I got married, really. Right mm. answer. <laughs> Some fascinating insights from couples married and thinking about marriage in Belfast. But does marriage still serve a purpose or has it just become an expensive piece of paper that's no longer relevant? You can take part in the debate by webcam or make your point by phone, text, email or online. And we're joined for this discussion by Tess Finch-Lees who blogs about ethics. Tess, a lot of people are concerned at the idea that marriage is declining. They think it matters. Aren't they right to? 
Historically, people generally got married because they thought it was better if they were going to have children. And generally, the outcomes are better for children born into married um, households. But that's not because of the marriage itself. It's because they tend to have higher incomes and better educated. So it's important not to confuse correlation with causation. In fact, poverty is a far greater determinant of children's outcome. With 3 million people, children living in poverty in the UK and 2.5 million fewer poverty. I would argue that that's a far more prevalent argument and more relevant debate than a piece of paper. All right, so marriage is, is just an irrelevance to the issue of raising healthy families, Peter. Fundamentally, it's about selfishness. And what we had in the 1960s was a great eruption of adult selfishness. People saying, right, I want to live life the way I want to live it. It's summed up by that ghastly song by Engelbert Humperdinck, Please Release Me, Let Me Go, in which the adults... The I never thought of that as being part of the, the adults, it was the anthem. It was the, it, was, it was the real anthem of the 60s. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the whole idea was that adults from then on would be allowed to indulge their own wishes. To, if they felt that they were constrained and hemmed in by, by what they regarded as unhappy marriages, then let rip, go and get a divorce, because the 1969 Divorce Law Reform Act made it easier to break up a marriage than it is to get out of the car leasing now, agreement. I mean, no, no, this is this, and so and, no, it, it's the, and this this unreformed from the moment it was passed. This act transformed our society from being a, a basically Protestant, self-denying uh, society to, to a self-indulgent society in which adults did what they liked. And everybody's had a lot of fun. The only class of people who've done badly out of it being the children, who've suffered immensely, immeasurably, and continue to suffer all the time, first of all from the divorce of their parents when there were still marriages to break up, and now increasingly from having fatherless families in which they don't have the undoubted benefits of having two loving parents throughout their childhood. OK. Yvonne, what are your thoughts on this? Well, at, um I think children are far more resilient than we give them credit for. And if I go back further than the 1960s, coming out of the Second World War, there were vast numbers of single mums, um, you know, because the, they were widowed, who raised uh, families um, the best way that they could. But having said that, as a Muslim, um, half my religion is based on on getting married. I was and, going to ask. And it is, you know, um, it, it is uh, very important. In fact, I think that uh, it's one thing in the Muslim community, uh, you know, strong family values. And in an ideal, perfect world, of course, um, the, the family is all important. Well, crucially, Islam allows divorce. Uh, but yes. it does say marriage is the bedrock of the family and cohabitation is not an option. No. Um, and is that right, among, you think? Not among practising or observing Muslims. Uh, it, uh, but do you it think isn't. it's right? I mean, do you feel that marriage is, in, in modern Britain, obsolete and unnecessary, or, you know, as Tess is arguing, that it's not how you needed to find a successful family? Um, no, I, I don't think marriage is obsolete. I think it is still very important um, in all religious uh, communities. But I don't think that the whole fabric of society would suddenly collapse if, um, if some, obviously I can't speak for the Muslim community, but for, uh, for other communities, if marriage wasn't uh, such a requirement. Well, that's the problem with the fabric of society. It doesn't suddenly collapse. It gradually crumbles. And that's what we've been watching for 50 years. It has gradually crumbled. And so we are a different kind but of society. But the idea, Peter, that marriage itself, the piece of paper is the glue that holds them together and makes them happy, is, is, is frankly ludicrous. Well, it's not a piece, it's, I, I it's up, not a piece I of paper. I grew, up in a country, I grew up in a country where divorce uh, wasn't uh, legal until uh, 15 years ago. Um, and I can tell you, it wasn't wall-to-wall -wall river dance. Um, domestic violence, child abuse existed, people were miserable, children were living in war zones. But that's all changed. That's, that's so not... Why now should we say marriage is irrelevant if it has all the safeguards? I mean, isn't there an argument that says cohabitation has all the disadvantages of marriage and none of the advantages? Uh, uh, the, quite the opposite, actually. And what we're doing here is making moral judgments on people's choices. We know that marriage in itself is no... Uh, panacea for happiness uh, and uh, and it's not and the idea that we judge people's choices and uh, people who are cohabiting is somehow uh, more superior or, or less superior than those who are married the contract that, that that's important here is not the legal contract it's the psychological contract well, and that's, that's, that's true and together. that's why that's why the referring, referring to marriage as a piece of paper is such a nonsense what it is is a, is a promise which both, it's people, which both people, it's well, it's actually a personal, what you need it's a personal is promise a and, a, and an oath. 
in the in the Christian concept of it to stay married for it's life. It's about intent, I suppose. Uh, but, and also, but no, I, I just perception. said one other thing. This, this stuff we always get about um, about domestic violence and child abuse. It, it, does anybody seriously believe that there's no domestic violence and no child abuse in unmarried households? On the contrary, uh, the worse the children are, at much greater risk in a household where there are serial boyfriends. Uh, than where there is a stable marriage. Okay. That is a but statistical but fact. But nobody's saying that, and I'm certainly Good. Well, it's that. appeared to, the point, to me the, that you were trying to say that. Absolutely not. The point, the point is, though, the, the idea that marriage itself okay. is, is a panacea, is, is an alternative. And it's, actually, it's, 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 actually, it's actually quite offensive to okay. the, um, the, the, I mean, the, the, the single parents and all oh, the fine. other I, I, I appreciate that's the point you're that. making. Mm. I want to bring in a, the Reverend Sally Hitchner here, um, who joins us by webcam. She's an Anglican priest, and, of course, you conduct marriages. Do you think they've become an expensive irrelevant? Relevant. So some people think certainly, uh, you know, the cost of them has gone up, and that seems to be often what people talk about. Well, they are very expensive. I mean, the average wedding costs above eighteen thousand a year, which is an extraordinary amount of money. And I would like to bring back the sort of romantic idea of marriage into this discussion. That actually, whatever the implications for the children, this is someone who's committing their life to look after you, and that really can't be bought. That, that can't, you can't put a price tag on that sort of commitment to someone who will care for you when you're sick and when you're dying, who will be up by your bedside, and not just when it's fun and when it's convenient, but, but for the rest of your life. And that's an amazing thing for someone to promise to you, whether that's through a marriage or a civil partnership. And, and Sally, you'll have heard this, this argument that it stigmatises couples who cohabit um, to say marriage is, is, is so valuable. I mean, how do you answer that? Well, I think it can uh, be something that is seen to be stigmatizing, or we could actually turn it on the head. And if you look at this particular legislation, what it's doing is benefiting uh, partners who stay at home with their children or who are on lower wage because they're working part time to look after children. And while I think it's important we allow women in particular to make a choice about whether they go out to work or whether they stay at home and look after children, what is important as a society is that we value everyone, and especially mums, and it is often mums, who stay at home and, and devote their lives to cooking and cleaning and looking after young children. Thank and I think you. that, it may sound like it's only £3.85 a week, but actually that is a, an important statement that society is making about the value of looking after This children. is the tax break you're talking about. Uh, uh, Reverend Sally Hitchener, yes. thank you. I'd like to briefly bring in Julianne Marriott here as well, who's a campaigner from Don't Judge My Family. You campaigned against this marriage, marriage tax break. I'm interested in this idea that... Um, you know, there should be no link made between um, marriage and success, and yet we know all the evidence shows that if you are, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to get married, and your children, children tend to want it, don't they? I know that Alistair Campbell says his children wish he'd get married. Well, I mean, first of all, um, we're not married. Um, we're actually anti the marriage tax allowance, um, and that's because the government is planning to spend £700 million on just some couples, that so only a third of married couples will actually even get the marriage tax allowance. So it discriminates against single parents, widows, widowers, it discriminates against cohabiting couples, it also discriminates against many marriages, including those where both of the couples go out to work, okay. even if they're on minimum wage. Um, but kind of coming back to, you know, lots of the proponents of this are quite openly admit they don't think it would encourage encourage people to marry, they don't think it will encourage them to stay married. And of all the married couples who get it, actually only 1.4 of them have children. So the kind of right. question is, is, what is it for? OK, I'm sorry, we have to stop it there, Julian, just because the quality of the line's quite bad. But thank you. I think there's a concern about whether the tax break really means anything and, and reaches the well, parents. Well, she's right about that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, but it's, well, it's the Tory party spending taxpayers' money trying to shore up their vote. There is a concern about, in no your value. view on marriage, where is the, the wife in it? You know, is, is yours a view of, of a kind of rosy domesticity where the wife stays home and raises Mine is the, the view of, the, of the, the, the marriage service in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer of the Church of England, which makes the two partners to the marriage equal, swearing uh, equal oaths to each other to, 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 to behave in certain ways which are essential. Uh, it's clear from it that it's, it, it's, it's designed to create a marriage of, of, of equal human beings and it's, it's the constitution, as far as I'm concerned, of private life. So there's no reason to assume that a marriage is some kind of tyranny. Okay. Uh, on, on the contrary, very briefly, they take it out of the. Um, you can you can, you can you can you can have it in or, or not have it. What do you have to do in return for being obeyed is pretty considerable. I have to tell you. 
Right, well, uh, I, th I think we have to agree to disagree on this one about whether marriage is a thing of the past. I think, don't think anyone's saying it's a thing of the past. But, no. uh, but there well, is, well, it's, it's, it's a thing of choice. A thing it of is the past, a matter of choice. Matter and of if you're choice. talking about romance, turning it into a cost benefit analysis uh, in terms of tax exemption uh, just undermines that argument completely. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Am I allowed to read a couple of viewers' comments? I'm hoping so. Ewan says, I've been married for almost 50 years. I promise to love, honour, and obey till death, um, till death parts us. I'm now looking after my wife who's ill. I wonder how many would stay around to care for a partner if they weren't married. An anonymous one marriage is pointless, expensive, and in many cases a religious concept. Making a commitment does not need paperwork, nor should it cost. Of course, you can have a very cheap wedding. Um, thank you all very much indeed. You've been voting on the um, question we set at the start of the programme this morning. Are Muslims doing enough to prevent the radicalisation of young people? The vote is closing now, so please don't text as your vote will not count, but you may still be charged, and we'll bring you the results at the end of the show. Now, tonight sees the start of a landmark series on BBC Two, The Ottomans, Europe's Muslim Emperors, presented by journalist Raghi Omar. Across three programmes, Raghi describes how the Ottoman sultans dominated one of the world's biggest empires, which survived for 600 years. But its impact still has important resonance today. Now, especially for Sunday Morning Live, Raghi gives us a flavour of what's to come in his new series. The Ottomans ruled over a multitude in which it was undone, left lasting political scars that are still being felt to this day. And it's another reason why learning about it, finding out about it, is, is, is so important to our world today. Here is an empire that started in medieval times, in the 1300s, and lived for 600 years. And by the time the rule of the Ottomans came to an end, we were in the industrial age. So here's this empire that spans the medieval age and ends you know, at a time when you know, there are aeroplanes and uh, steam engines and, 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 and the modern world. That's an amazing period of history for one dynasty to rule. The Ottomans, Europe's Muslim Emperors, is on tonight at 9pm on BBC Two. And now we can bring you the result of our viewer vote. We asked, are Muslims doing enough to prevent radicalisation of young people? And here's what you told us. 4% of those of you who voted said yes, they are. And 96% said no, they aren't. It's always just a snapshot. There is a big image problem here, isn't there, Osama? It's mainly an image problem. Muslims are doing a lot. We can do more, of course, but it's a problem for wider society as well. It's not just an issue for Muslims. Muslims can deal with the religious aspects counter extremist discourse, etc. But uh, a question like that puts Muslims apart from the rest of society, which is not right in itself. Well, we're all part of British society and it's up to all of society to deal with this. Peter Hitchens. Well, can you ever do enough to, to prevent... What people are really saying here is can you ever do enough to prevent the horrible things which have been done in the name of Islam? And I think that you can't and, uh, and obviously more can and should be done. Whether it should take the form of suppression of freedom of speech is another matter altogether. And briefly, your focus would be on what, though? Well, I, I just think we have to argue for our own society as, and, and, for its, and for its virtues and to remember what they are, and they are fundamentally Christian. Until we do that, we haven't got much of an argument to place against Islam. Yvonne Ridley. Again, it's down to discussion and opening up the discussion and remembering that universities are places where there should be all sorts of discourse and, uh, and not trying to control freedom of speech or trying to push one narrative. Bring, bring everyone in for a full discussion. I might be able to get in one or two of your comments. Uh, Nick says, radicals hate mainstream Muslims as much as they hate everyone else. What are mainstream Muslims supposed to do? Um, Daniel says, British Muslims are segregating themselves from society. They believe non-believers are wrong in their beliefs. Aussie says Muslims are doing all they can, but the root cause of radicalisation, actions of Western governments, is beyond their control. An anonymous one says, I think the problem is we don't hear what Muslims are doing to prevent radicalisation of young people, so it seems they aren't. Thank you all to everyone who's taken part in today's programme via webcam, also in the studio. And my guests in the studio were Peter Hitchens, Yvonne Ridley, Usama Hassan, as well as Professor Peter Neumann and Tess Finchlees, who joined us earlier. Don't text or call the lines anymore, they are now closed, but continue the conversation online. Links are on our website.